Greetings and welcome to those of you in class and those of you online. Uh, this class will last seven weeks. Handouts are available for the classes. They can be found on the right side of the screen where it will describe handouts and you can download them, save a PDF file for future reference as well as print them out to follow along in class. Uh, the handouts basically contain the written information and quotes that you will find on screen for the PowerPoint presentation. I do a good deal of ad lib and if you want those notes you get, have to write them down. Uh, the text for this class, and you'll find this at the bottom of your notes, there are two class texts. They are available. At this point, these books have been out of print for some time and are available only in ebook format. And they, one of them is currently available online, which is the Horoscope Maker and Reader. I actually only wrote it down as Reader. Um, believing that the maker wasn't going to be in there. But you can all meet your maker and <laughs> download this book. <clears throat> and it is $9.95. The same for Astrology and its Psychological Correspondences by Dennis Sutton, which I think is an excellent book for an introduction to Hermetic Astrology. Also, $9.95, and by tomorrow or, or the next day, that should also be online. In future classes, I will be giving homework reading assignments from uh, these books. So there is an advantage to having both of them. Much of what I teach from, however, is actually derived from the 21 Brotherhood of Light lessons. Unfortunately, the material for my introductory class is not available all in one book. It's actually scattered across uh, courses to Astrological Signatures, Course 8, Orary Astrology, and Course 10, Delineating the Horoscope. 10 1. So, 10-1, yes. Thank you. So it can be found uh, in all of those books separately. And the other great piece of promotion here is all of the 21 Brotherhood of Light lessons are now available in a downloadable ebook format or on CD-ROM. This is one way to get 24 different books in one. <clears throat> Carl Jung said, at the moment, I am looking into astrology, which seems indispensable for a proper understanding of mythology. There are strange and wondrous things in these lands of darkness. Please, don't worry about my wanderings in these infinitudes. I shall return laden with booty, with rich booty for our knowledge of the human psyche. Any class on astrology really needs to begin with a breakdown of the word. Um, and in case you don't read Greek, it comes to us from the Greek, astro meaning star, and logos, which truly means word or speech. But it has also come down to mean um, logic or knowledge. Study of. Are you, they used to say, when I was in school, they would say that it's study of. Study of. But truly, it literally means speech. So basically, I like to call astrology um, star knowledge. Astrology is the study of the influence of the heavens to life and events on earth. Prior to the modern era, astronomy and astrology were synonymous. 
astrology, astronomy, I should say, actually was developed as a means to gain greater skill with astrology. And this was true up through the times of uh, Kepler and Copernicus and Galileo. The origins of astrology are in observation. If you have ever gone to, and I know some of you have gone to parts of this state, devoid of light pollution, and if you look at the night sky, there is nothing more awe-inspiring out there. Prior to the age of television, really what humans had to do was sit around the campfire, keeping warm, telling stories, and looking at the sky. Perhaps the earliest written form or symbolic form, which shows a knowledge of the human um, understanding astrology was a crescent-shaped antler with 13 notches, which was discovered in a cave in the Pyrenees. I used to have a book that had this image in it. Here are some other similar types of images of, of prehistoric artifacts. This is perhaps the earliest evidence of ancient humans observing the stellar human interrelationship. What, why would the number 13 be particularly important? Any ideas? Well, it's actually the number of days that falls between the visible new moon and the full moon. And like many animals that are tied in to a biological cycle <coughs> that is also um, lunar influenced, early um, human mothers menstruated with the full moon. And you can only imagine this was an important time for them and they would want to be able to uh, note the number of dates. They were able to recognize that interrelationship between the moon, symbolized by the crescent form of the antler, and their <coughs> monthly period. Now around the world, different systems of astrology developed in the ancient centers of civilization. Many forms of ancient architecture, um, this word is wrong, it should be were, actually used as observatories instead of where. So here is um, an image of Sumerian architecture. Much of what we use in astrology was developed in the Near East and in Egypt. Though there are structures here in the New World that are aligned to the solstices and equinoxes as well as other symbolic planetary activities that are encoded uh, numerically into the structures themselves, that lower image there is um, the El Castillo at Chichen Itza in the Yucatan. Up here, I can't remember, I believe this is um, a sighting stone that is in the Andes, and I believe it's uh, Machu Picchu. And uh, in India, also China was a great center of astronomical, astrological learning. Now there are similarities between and differences between the Near Eastern and the Egyptian uh, astronomical systems. 
these and as well as there are between uh, Indian, East Indian, and Babylonian systems of astrology. Those three systems all have interrelationships. The systems in the New World, both um, Mayan and Aztec, as well as Incan systems, developed separately, as did um, Chinese astronomy, astrology, developed separately from the Western system. So, close up on the earlier picture of a ziggurat. In the system of astrology that we are learning, which is Western astrology, specifically Hermetic astrology, which is a form of standard astrology, evolved from Chaldean. Yes. Um, going back to what you said on the, on the previous slide. Yes. And you talked about how um, Chinese and New World astrology, they developed along a separate track. Did they, was it at the same time? Do you know? Well, we don't, um, I don't know for certain. Uh, it's, it's believed that New World happened later, but the, the archaeology of the New World is constantly being re, redefined. Yeah, reassessed because primarily it was believed that there was only human habitation here going back 10,000 years to the time of the last ice age and uh, the land bridge that would have been formed across the Bering Strait. But there are actually um, archaeological deals, digs, both in um, Chile and in Florida that have um, finds that are dated much earlier than that, I believe going back 30 or 45,000 years. Mm -hmm. So the point to all of this, and I actually go back and forth in my personal convictions about it, depending on what authors I read, but mm -hmm. from the time of Plato forward, there has been speculation on what was called Atlantis. Mm -hmm. We have no proof of this. I mean, there's, there's folklore about this. There is evidence popping up in different parts of the world which emphasize stellar knowledge and there are sort of crossovers of culture and traditions and certainly there is uh, folklore all around the world of great floods and people arriving by boats. Um, so there, there is a possibility that there may have been, you know, some culture prior to all of this or it may be symbolic. You know, Atlantis might represent something else other than a place of human occupation. But even Zane in his writings was an adherent to the belief at that time that there was a pre-civilization and that, you know, knowing of the impending doom, that priest of stellar wisdom set sail and had contact with seven centers of civilization and left their mark there. So the systems, that, although there are certain things numerically that come up repeatedly in all of these cultures, there are other things that are so different that it's hard to imagine that um, they actually came from a literate, um, you know, pre-culture. So, for me, the, the jury's still out on all of this. And I don't know if I actually answered the question since I forgot it. Um, well, well, yeah, you did, because okay. that was the reason I was asking the question. I was wondering, did they all just spontaneously develop a system of, of astrology, or did, was there some, something that might have connected them together? Or that's, That was really the question mm -hmm. I was trying to, to get at, so yeah, you, you did. So, back to the, you know, the Chaldean, the Assyrian, Sumerian, Babylonian, 
you know, the area of Mesopotamia, which means between the rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, is where at least, you know, in acceptable archaeology, this is where we believe civilization started. Though even that's always being rewritten, and there's discoveries of sculptures and things that are now believed to be of human origin 200,000 years old. Um, so, <laughs> you know? It's been around. Yeah, long. it depends on which um, system you want to work with. And I think, they're, they're, I think folklore is incredibly valuable you know, oral tradition, and I think science is incredibly valuable, and one has to find a balance between the two of those, because science is constantly rewriting itself. So, anyways, here, Mesopotamia. What we use in astrology today that came from this region are the 12 signs of the zodiac. The planets, though they only had awareness of the, what we call the lower octave planets. The sun and moon were included as planets, and then the uh, planet Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn were also observed. The sexagesimal system of measuring time and geometry. What is sexagesimal? Anyone here? Sixes? Sixes. Yeah, well, sexy actually means 60. <laughs> so, yeah. next time somebody calls you sexy, uh, sexy six. I'm almost there. <laughs> I'm only starting at fifty-four. <laughs> We're moving in that direction. So, this is divisions of sixty, and we still happen to use the um, the Chaldean Babylonian system of measuring when we measure time and geometry spherical geometry. Come on. All right. The real gift to us from the Egyptians in all of this, besides really profound lore um, and these architectural wonders left behind, which are actually believed by many contemporary authors to be aligned to constellations. But the Egyptians developed the deacons, which are the 10 degree sections of the zodiac that are still in use in hermetic astrology. And basically what they were doing, their observation was observing the eastern horizon prior to sunrise and dividing the sky into basically 10 day or 10 degree sections and 36 decadence. So pretty much we've discussed this. The origins of Western astrology are truly in this um, Assyrian-Babylonian tradition. And I'm repeating myself. That's very good for... We learn through repetition. Yes, we learn through repetition. All right, here we have... Um, the Egyptian astrology. This is a little hard to see, the image, uh, but this is actually a later period image that comes from the, the Greek period in Egypt, the Ptolemaic periods. And this is known as the Zodiac of Dendra. And here again, the Heliacal rising of the constellations, so that means before Helios or the Sun. All right, this class is an introduction to Hermetic astrology, and it would not be complete without a discussion of Hermeticism. So, uh, this image comes from the, uh, the tiled floor of the Duomo in Siena. And actually, 
comes from the Renaissance period, where the scholars and philosophers and artists of that time were starting to revisit uh, the pagan writings and um, ancient knowledge of Plato and Aristotle and Aratus and uh, Ptolemy and other authors that suddenly became available at that time. And in this image, we can see um, Hermes Trismegistus offering um, the books of knowledge to Moses, who is the dominant figure in the image. What we know about Hermes Trismegistus, this may have been a real person, but pretty much uh, scholars have concluded that he was an allegorical figure, that he represented something, a larger body of knowledge. He was identified with the Egyptian god Thoth, who looked like that. He was ebus headed the Hermetic sciences which he gave us are astrology, alchemy, and magic. And those of you who have studied the Brotherhood of Light lessons for any length of time will actually see the divisions that are in those 21 lessons, seven courses under each of these, um, uh, each of these things. Now, the Hermetic axiom, which is probably the simplest and the most powerful thing that has been passed down to us, is as above, so below. That forms the key of Hermeticism, that the microcosm is a reflection of the macrocosm. So, in the body of man is reflected the positions of the planets against the background of the zodiac at the time of birth. And in Hermeticism, the chart at the time of birth represents the map of consciousness of the individual. It's sort of a holographic image of the whole. In our studies, we use what are called the two keys. The gold key can also be referred to as the written tradition. It is considered to be scientific and it accords with astrology astronomy, which is basically the script written in the heavens. And gold is the metal ruled by the sun, so it's considered to be masculine in nature. The silver key is the oral tradition. This is not scientific, and as I said earlier, one has to constantly weigh um, folklore and oral tradition against what's discovered by science. Uh, just to give an example, you know, many of the modern medicines are actually discovered by um, um, oh, that's a, it's, I'm drawing a blank, but it is a branch of anthropology which where anthropologists go into the rainforest and interact with native peoples and learn uh, what the plants and or animal products are that they use in healing. Um, and of course at 2 a.m. this morning I'll wake up remembering what the, <laughs> the specific name for that area of study is. It also corresponds to divination, which is a foreknowledge of future events. 
And it's a way of accessing information that um, falls outside of the realm of logic. The Tarot is, in our system, the uh, representative of the silver key, and it corresponds to the moon, the planet that rules the metal silver. So people tend to go down one or either of the paths. Knowing both paths is really important because the Tarot offers us pictured representatives of astrological knowledge, but it's in a symbolic language which tends to speak more um, clearly and directly to the soul through imagery. Anth Here of Anthrobotany? Yes, anthropotony is one of them, but it's um, it's a pharmaco. I forget the the remainder of it, but anthropotony is one um, ethno ethnobotanist. There you have it. It's ethnobotany. Yeah, that's what she does. And that's what Peg said. Peg, thank you, Peg. I'm glad one of us has a memory. <laughs> all right. Now, almost all of the language that we use when we study astrology comes to us from the Greeks. Why? Under Alexander the Great, the Greeks conquered both Mesopotamia and under his general Ptolemy, they conquered Egypt. Egypt was, prior to that time, sort of the longest surviving and somewhat static culture in the world, having gone for probably close to 4,000 years, somewhat uninterrupted. You know, Rome, what, rose and fell in 200 years? We're only about 200 years into, you know, U.S. culture, and it's looking fairly shaky. Uh, Greek domination lasted about 500 years. So, <clears throat> something to think about. What happened over time is the, what, it was truly amazing about the Greeks was their ability to go in and synthesize knowledge from various different groups and to be able to combine it into a larger body of knowledge. So the astrological knowledge of the Babylonians and Egyptian uh, were combined by Greek mathematicians, philosophers, astronomers, astrologers, uh, to become the system we know today. For the ancient Greeks, if you remember, um, they had nine muses. If you've ever been to a museum, it's actually named after the muses, of which uh, one was Urania. And they considered, of all of the sciences, that astronomy, astronomia, astrologia, was the queen of the sciences. It combined all of them, you know, logic, math, philosophy, geometry, uh, into its system. And there she is. The muse. What's that? Pretty sexy. Yeah, sexagesimal system. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, definitely Urania's hot. And uh, her symbols were the globe and compass. There are so many Greeks that I can't bore you with all of them. I'm going to quickly, since we're talking about the history of astrology, I'm going to quickly touch on just a few individuals who 
out of the Greek system have subsequently impacted what we learn and study today. Perhaps preeminent among them was Hipparchus. You can see he's a Greek mathematician who lived approximately 190 to 120 BC. Um, <clears throat> born in Turkey, but remember back then that part of Asia Minor was Greek culture. And he is the person who um, discovered the procession of the equinox. This is the fact that the equinox moves backwards through the zodiac one degree every 72 years. So I think it's approximately 2,150 years to an astrological cycle where the, uh, the equinoctial collier moves backwards through each sign of the zodiac. He did this only by studying the star charts and positions of two Egyptian astrologers that lived prior to him. And he was able to note in their charts because what single human life would have 72 years of observation in it? Mm -hmm. And one degree is still a pretty small amount to note over a 72 year period. It's like watching paint dry, mm -hmm. you know, you just don't see it. But he is accredited with that. Now it's, it's quite possible that ancient Egyptians knew that a lot earlier. And especially, there's a lot of new discovery going on now trying to uh, determine the age of the Sphinx, which is believed to be vastly older than the surrounding pyramids uh, based on the erosion patterns on the Sphinx. So it, it is quite possible that he just dug up a more ancient piece of Egyptian knowledge and applied it, but we do credit him with this discovery because we have nothing else in writing that says somebody else did it. Aristarchus is Samos. <laughs> what? Aristarchus of Samos. Dis discovered it in 280 BC. Okay. All right. This is uh, one of my favorite authors, is Aratus, also known as Aratos. And this is a, even a little bit earlier than the other guy. Probably born somewhere around 315 to 310 BC and died 240 BC. He wrote uh, a treatise called The Phenomena, which is a descriptive work of the constellations. It includes all of the 48 constellations that we recognize today as being the 12 signs of the zodiac and the 36 decadence. And he describes also their relationship to weather more. All right. This Ptolemy was a Roman citizen living in Egypt and writing in Greek about a hundred years after the birth of Christ. And he wrote two books, the Almagest and the Tetrabiblios, which are sort of the, the Bibles of astrology. And um, so much of modern Western astrology is actually based upon uh, the star lore and traditions that are in his writings and uh, some of the techniques that if they were not developed by him, they were certainly placed into writing by him. <clears throat> so, here you can see the word horoscopic astrology. This is the astrology we know today. Backpedaling a bit, if we go back to what we know about early Egyptian astrology and Near Eastern astrology, it was less about um, describing 
the horoscopes, the character, the psychological makeup of individuals, at least from what can be determined by the writings left. And I got to see um, this last summer when I was lecturing in Chicago in June. I had the opportunity to visit the Oriental Institute on the campus of the University of Chicago. And they had quite a lot of cuneiform tablets and other artifacts there, some of which were um, specifically astrological, astronomical. And really what their concerns were, were what we would call today mundane astrology. They were concerned with the rise and fall of kings, territories being invaded, wars and battles won. Things of that nature were of greater influence and of greater importance to them than the individual. <coughs> And we can see, even early among the Greeks, it was less about casting this to find out the psychological makeup of an individual, but looking for weather portents. Why would that be important to the Greeks? Any ideas? Agriculture, mm -hmm. Agriculture and shipping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Greeks were primarily um, merchant traders and um, pirateers. They were like the Vikings in their day, who would just descend upon villages and, you know, rape, pillage, and loot, and then move on. That was their way of living. So, you know, we like to think of them as fine, upstanding citizens, which some of them were, but, you know, really the way they, they acquired this information from all parts of the world was through this, you know, old process, it's not that old, there's still people that do it today, which is going in and taking what you want. Well, you know, it's interesting that you point out that they really weren't that interested in the individual. It was more what they as a group were going to be able to, whether they could survive as a group or a country, or I don't know, whatever they're collecting. The king right, and they, the they weren't a group like we think today of Greece as a nation, which right. they weren't. They were right. really a collection of city-states, much it's like the yeah, you know, it's much like the pueblos here in New Mexico where we live, where you have thirteen different um, cultures basically where that mm -hmm. have. The difference is the Greeks pretty much shared a language. There were probably different dialects according to whether you lived in Sparta or in um, Ephesus, but the same written language and the same culture, but basically individual and even warring with one another. So, but what started happening about 2,500 years ago was the concept of horoscopic astrology, which was, you can see, was really perfected about 2,000 years ago. And this was the focus on the individual. And this is definitely more Greek and Roman in nature. Hippocrates, who was he? Father of Western medicine. Okay. Here we're looking at the 4th to 5th century BC. He insisted that his students study astrology. His saying was, a physician without the knowledge of astrology has no right to call himself a physician. Again, relating back to the as above, so below concept. And this system of medicine, probably what is closest to it that's practiced today would be both Ayurvedic medicine and uh, homeopathic medicine. Both work on the models of the um, basically the humors and constitution of the individual and being able to determine illness and remedies from that.
Has anyone heard of a disaster? Yeah, well, most of us have had plenty in our lives, but it is a it is a word which shows that how astrology has permeated our language. It means ill-starred. A catastrophe. Ever had one of those? <laughs> well, what happened was against the stars. Influenza, anyone? Oh, wow. Under the astrological influences. It comes from the Italian. Anyone Mazel here speak tov. Yiddish? <laughs> Mazel tov. Basically, you're under a good constellation. When you say Mazel tov to someone, we interpret it to mean good luck, but it basically means may your stars and planets be good. And any of you who watched Laverne and Shirley in the 70s probably also know the term schlamazel. Or if you spent a lot of time in Jewish households. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, it is an ill-starred person. Hmm. A schlamazel is somebody who is always having disasters and catastrophes. So that's just an example of how astrological language has um, permeated our culture. You know, other examples of that could be the days of our week. You know, Sunday and Moon Day are really straightforward. But the other days which we use in English, in Latin based languages, with the exception of Portuguese, uh, basically the other days of the week after the sun and moon, they follow the order of the planetary hours. So we've got sun, moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. Only we use the um, Nordic equivalent for those gods. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but we go back to Saturday. So Saturday, Sunday, and Moon Day still maintain their um, Roman planetary associations. All right. Horoscope. This actually comes to us from the Latin horoscopius. Anyone know what an horologist is? Clock maker. So the word our view. What happens in a horoscope? This point on the eastern horizon is changing every two hours. So that is the hour view. Now, old, old systems used um, six daytime hours and six nighttime hours, so 12. Modern clock system, which we have on our wall, we have 12 daytime hours and 12 nighttime hours. So what a modern horoscope is, is a two-dimensional diagrammatic representation, the word of should be in there, of planetary positions against a backdrop of the heavens in reference to a specific location on Earth at a given time. That is what we're looking at when we learn horoscopic astrology this modern practice that has only been in use for a mere 2,500 years. There are different branches of astrology. Natal astrology, which reveals the character of an individual and their life experiences. 
This is my area of interest and study. There's orary astrology, which is used to answer specific questions. Electional astrology is used to choose the best time to begin any undertaking. Mundane astrology studies world trends and events. And weather predicting, much like the ancient Greeks, allows us to study planetary positions and determine their impact on temperature, wind conditions, and moisture. Spiritual astrology, often overlooked, is actually the study of the relationship of solar and lunar calendar systems on religious holidays and folkloric traditions. And I do personally think, in addition to natal astrology, this is probably the most fascinating area of astrological study. So on to Hermetic astrology. We've talked a bit about the history of Western astrology. <clears throat> but Hermetic astrology, the term was basically coined back in the beginning of the 20th century by C.C. Zane, a.k.a. Albert Benjamin who was probably the most prolific astrological author in the first half of the last century. He wrote for 40 years out of the first 50 years of the 20th century. <clears throat> Thousands of articles and numerous books just to name a few. Some of these you will be seeing. Uh, Beginner's Horoscope Maker and Reader is in, now back in ebook format. We do have Astrological Lore of All Ages in print format. And you may, over the next couple of years, see some of these others coming forward and being available again. They've been out of print for about the last 40 years. Now, under the aegis of the Brotherhood of Light slash Church of Light, and using the nom de plume of C.C. Zane, he authored the 24 books that comprise the 21 Brotherhood of Light lessons. Here are images of a few different um, incarnations of these lessons. I left out the black book. I'll have to get one of those in there. And the little blue pamphlets, which were favorites. His astrological system, for which he coined the term hermetic, combined ancient practice, contemporary mathematics, and an active research department. And his work would impact future generations of astrological notables. He was born Benjamin P. Williams to Dr. William Williams and Emma Green Williams at 5.55 a.m. on December 12, 1882, near Adele, Iowa. His family remembered this year as the, great, the year the Great Comet flashed across the sky. Benjamin was a natural seer, and he had many um, psychic abilities and experiences in his youth. In the next life, which is the penultimate book in the Brotherhood of Light Lessons, he describes an incident from his youth where he used his psychic abilities to help locate the missing bodies of two drowning victims. Throughout the lessons, it is so infrequent that he includes any personal information, and um, this is pretty fascinating, just from both that perspective and what he was actually able to do. Now, in 1900, at the age of 17, he began studying astrology. Why? In order to debunk it. 
He scoffed at the idea that planets could influence human affairs. He calculated the charts of family and friends and discovered that astrology worked in spite of its apparent absurdity. Certain authors who young Benjamin studied alluded to a mystery school known as the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor. In 1909, at age 28, he attended a meeting of the Brotherhood in Denver, Colorado. In a surprising chain of events, his life would be turned upside down when he was commissioned by the brothers to place their teachings into writing. Benjamin had studied at Iowa State University to become a naturalist. He was instrumental in the founding of a bird sanctuary in Los Angeles County. And you will see his um, knowledge of natural history coming up across um, all of the lessons. Of course, having been written anywhere from close to 100 to 50 years ago, 60 years ago, when the last edits were made in the books. Um, some of the, the natural and scientific information is outdated, but the um, concepts that he discusses are pretty remarkable. Uh, his wife wrote in 1940, he was subjected to much ridicule by his relatives for believing in such bunk, or for trying to get them to believe in it. Here were people close to him who were representatives of the well-educated, who scoffed at the thing which through rigorous experiment he found to be true. He decided that for all he knew, there might be whole continents of phenomena which as yet had not been explored. She goes on to say, he would still be a naturalist, but starting with that winter of 1898 to 1899, the natural history in which he would specialize and in which he would try to be useful to his fellow man would be the natural history of realms and forces not commonly recognized. Benjamin moved to Los Angeles in May 1915. On November 11th, 1918, the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor disbanded and the Brotherhood of Light opened its doors to the public. And there's a um, picture of one of the very early classrooms in Los Angeles. I believe this was downtown or around downtown. This was either on 6th Street or on Virgil. Upon moving to Los Angeles, Benjamin P. Williams would later change his name to Albert Benjamin in order to protect his family. His father was a doctor and a deacon in the Disciples of Christ Church, and Benjamin's interest in occultism and astrology were frowned upon in his community. The Brotherhood of Light teachings were written between March 21st, 1914 and February 20th, 1934 by Albert Benjamin under the pen name of C.C. Zane. Benjamin chose to use a pseudonym for any writings he did for the Brotherhood of Light in order to keep the work separately identified from the writings he published under his own name. Here he is at his typewriter. Uh, many of us had the opportunity to spend time up on the hill on Coral Street, which actually uh, was east of Los Angeles and overlooked downtown Los Angeles. It was back up until 1960 readily, um, one could readily commute from there to downtown on the red car, on the streetcar that ran down Broadway. <clears throat> 
Sisi's Ain saw himself not so much as the author of original thought, but rather as an amanuensis, or scribe, writing down the information he received from the inner plane brethren. He would subject his impressions to rigorous research and find comparisons available in the contemporary science of his day. In 1932, anti-astrological ordinances were passed in Los Angeles County aimed at prohibiting both the teaching and practice of astrology. It appeared as though through political forces would once again drive the Brotherhood underground. The Brotherhood of Light closed its membership roster and became the Church of Light just prior to the passage of those ordinances. The Church of Light was incorporated under the laws of the State of California on November 2, 1932 in order to teach, practice, and disseminate the religion of the stars. Here is a wonderful quote from Edward Dome. Astrology is the science of finding and utilizing the natural potentialities as indicated in the planetary chart at birth. It becomes a religion when it shows the individual how these natural tendencies can and should be utilized for the benefit of all mankind and for the furtherance of the purposes of deity. So, for us, astrology is religious. Back to the classroom. In the late 30s, the Church of Light Quarterly was being mailed to 16,000 students free of charge. Church of Light classes were open to the public on a free will offering basis. They still are. Please offer freely. <laughs> well put. During the Great Depression, many persons benefited from this policy who otherwise would be unable to afford classes. Astrology comprised seven of the 21 Brotherhood of Light lessons. There are seven courses devoted to alchemy or transmuting planetary energies and seven courses devoted to magic, which basically has to do with the use of extrasensory perception. All right. C.C. Zane was a unique leader in that he opposed hero worship and cult-like behavior. He discouraged members from taking any of his writings on blind belief, but rather encouraged them to subject them to rigorous testing of their own. Church of Light members were given freedom of conscience and encouraged to study as many things about religion, science, and the mysteries as they could and then ultimately draw their own conclusions. Within the first half of the 20th century, these teachings were distributed around the world. And like the writings of Bailey, Blavatsky, Steiner, and Heindel, the works of C.C. Zane have impacted the lives of thousands of students of Western occultism. Albert had been informed by the brothers that he should have everything completed by 1950. He passed from the physical plane on November 18, 1951. In accordance with instructions, he was cremated. There was no public funeral. His legacy is a body of work that is certain to hold a place in the history of Western spiritual tradition. So that's the history of Hermetic Astrology. And what I'd like to do over the next hour of class, um, and before I do this, I, I want to talk about what Hermetic Astrology is and how it works. But are there any questions up to this point on the 
uh, history portion. And those of you who are online, um, just a further piece of information is on the left-hand side of your screen, hopefully you've logged in to let us know you're there and to send a very nice greeting to us. We're <laughs> looking forward to receiving them. Uh, you can ask questions. Now, this does not assure that I will get them or answer them, but, but please attempt because uh, you got to try. You can, you can write in questions there. You can chat with one another. Uh, we have Bart here who is both manning the camera and trying to scan the, um, I don't know what to call it, a bulletin board on the side at the same time. So hopefully if a question or comment comes up, she'll be able to read that and relay it to me. So if anyone out there has a question, there is a delay in time between the time that I'm speaking here and before this broadcast reaches you and then something comes back to me. But uh, please feel free to participate uh, to whatever degree you can from um, online. Anyone in the room have questions about the history? Most of you have been inculcated into this by now. No, it's, no, it's really interesting. All right. This is what we're going to do. We have seven weeks left in class. Excuse me, six weeks. This will be seven. This class is going to be on exploring the building blocks which are essential to the hermetic system of astrology. And those building blocks are basically known as the four factors of astrology. These four factors are generally used to some degree in all forms of astrology. And they form the basis of what has been called standard astrology. They are the 12 signs of the zodiac, which we will discuss next week, 10 planets, 12 mundane houses, and the 10 aspects all comprise the four factors of astrology. Now, in addition to those four factors, Hermetic astrology also uses what are called astrodynes. And we will be looking at astrodynes in the sixth class of this series, and specifically how to delineate a chart with the use of astrodynes. The uh, hermetic system also uses the hermetic system of progressions, which I believe I've taught in a previous class though I don't know if it's archived or not. I'd have to do a little research. I believe I taught that last year. And I think it's archived, so <clears throat> that is more advanced. In the very last or seventh class, we're going to do what is called the seven steps of judging, or what I call easy chart analysis. And we will go through and take planet signs, houses, aspects, applying astrodynes and look at a chart and develop the skill of analysis or delineating a chart. Once this um, class is completed, there will be on a Saturday in March a laboratory of astrology that's held here. Unfortunately, we will not be broadcasting it only because the individuals in class um, may be addressing specific things about their um, own charts that they don't necessarily want to have accessible to everyone everywhere in the world. So that will just be an in-house um, private exploration. So what is an astrological chart? And this is, again, the question we have to ask. And in a beginning class, it's something that needs to be explored, but I've actually found um, that in, so often it's just glossed over. And 
What we are looking at when we look at a chart is a two-dimensional map of consciousness. I like to refer to the astrological chart as being our spiritual DNA. And just as there are basically 22 runs on the DNA chromosome, um, there are 22 key factors that we use in Hermetic Astrology, these being the uh, 12 signs and 10 planets. It has been called a blueprint of the soul. And what it does is the astrological chart maps our dominant trends in thinking. The term Character is destiny means a lot when you study astrology, and our approach is not fatalistic. We look at the astrological chart as being a map of character. What do you think happens when you change your character? You change your destiny. Now granted, it is the hardest work in the world for any of you who have ever attempted it. And it is the most rewarding work you will ever do. But the first place you have to start is through a thorough knowledge or understanding of your own chart before you can set about the process of changing it. So what we are looking at when we look at an astrological chart is the fact that planets are functioning as thought cells in consciousness. They are operating in a four-dimensional realm, and they impact dominant trends of thinking and feeling, which in turn attract uh, specific events and experiences into our lives. Christopher, like, what would be an example of a thought cell in your thinking? Like, um... Well, we will be talking about them in depth in two weeks, but we break them down as being belonging to particular thought series, which are um, power, domestic, intellectual, social, aggressive, um, let me move, religious, uh, safety, individualistic, utopian, and universal welfare. So a thought cell, let's say you have the aggressive, thought cells prominent, you might spend a lot of time thinking about being pissed off. Yeah. Okay. And you could devote a lot of your daily energy to that. I've known a few that do. <laughs> um, and by the same token, due to the amount of time that you devote to this particular thought cell, massaging it and you know, rubbing it and exercising it and building up its strength, <clears throat> you might find that you cut yourself in the kitchen, or burn yourself on the stove, or bump your toe as you get out of bed, or fall down the stairs, or get into a car accident, or develop a fever, or end up having surgery, and other things which we consider to be of, of like nature to those aggressive thought cells. Uh, what happens is, through the process of like attracting like, you start to draw to yourself corresponding experiences in the greater world in which you exist. It starts to enter into a sympathetic rapport with your dominant trends of thinking. This could happen with the safety thought cells, which when twisted enough it expresses fear and anxiety and worry and depression. And then there's more joyful things, such as religious thought cells, which stimulate uh, good humor, charitability, uh, abundance, and a sense of flow in one's life. So there was a very long explanation to a very short question. Great. Give some reality to it. So, no, thank you. Um, the specific nature is determined by the planetary thought series, which we just identified. Now, here's how it works. 
if these thought cells are harmonious, their natural inclination is to attract pleasurable events into their lives. Show of hands, who likes pleasurable events? I do, I do. Yeah. So, what we are attempting to do through, uh, again, through the study of astrology, it's just not to know what be fate, fate might befall us, but it's what can we do about it? And how can we stimulate these harmonious thought cells, be it through trends of thinking, feeling, acting, through colors, gemstones, um, physical environments, certain people, etc. <coughs> how do we get more of this um, pleasure out of life? Because I can actually guarantee you that left to its own devices, you will have sufficient pain in your life. As, does anyone here feel they've not had sufficient pain? Mm -hmm. Plenty of things. Okay. Only the masochists. Right. <laughs> and the, the seats are empty, so they took the night off. So, what happens is discordant thought cells attract these painful experiences, which truly, when we look at it from the spiritual perspective, these are the things that really benefit us and um, teach us, but the truth is for the organism to survive, it needs a break. Mm -hmm. There has to be periods of intensity and periods of rest. And the pleasurable periods provide us the periods of rest. Many of you have seen this diagram before, but I use it repeatedly because I think it's one of the key concepts that Zane works with, which I've not been able to find in other authors' work, to actually describe to us how astrology works. You know, how is it this absurd concept that, you know, a celestial body, hundreds of thousands of miles away could have any influence either on my consciousness or events in my life. So, Zane describes this as an inner plane, outer plane, interrelationship. This information can be found in Course 1, The Laws of Occultism, which really sets the tone for understanding how all of this phenomena works. Um, the outer plane, most of us are pretty well familiar with, and that is the realm in which our physical body resides, and where we're constantly dealing with these concepts of time and space. The inner plane was called by the ancients astral. Here you see the same word that we saw in disaster and catastrophe. Astral means of a star. So the ancients believed that this inner plane environment um, really was this excellent medium or substance through which astral influences, celestial influences, uh, operated. There is a boundary line between the two of these which operates at 186,172 miles per second, more or less. We are told that nothing can move faster than that. But that is, of course, only in the physical realm. I think um, physics have never been the easiest thing for me to understand because I failed um, algebra three times and never got beyond that. <laughs> Nevertheless, the concepts are not hard to understand. And, um, and what I've been reading lately about quantum physics is that, um, I forget what they're called, photons? But basically there are, um, yeah, they may be joined, separated, move in two separately different directions, yet are responding at vast distances to one another's activities, kind of like soulmates. I, I sort of surmise. 
on a certain level. So there, there are things that seem to be moving faster than the speed of light, which if over um, distances, microscopic points can be interconnected to one another. Something, there is something else out there where all of this is operating. So, there are your photons or your, um, your soul, your unconscious mind, operates in this realm which is moving above the speed of light. Heretofore to be referred to as the effort boundary line. <laughs> the EBL. Here your body is on the physical plane. There is a connection between the two of them, usually described in the chart as the line that runs from the midheaven to the ascendant. But I imagine that's just a symbol. It's, it is something much more subtle. And, and, and if this may be stretching it a little abstractly, too. But I was certainly the other night when we were watching fractals and this process of going into self-replicating patterns into smaller and smaller levels, that there has to be a point where they sort of cross over into another plane, where they get so infinitesimally small. Um, so I also like to look at an astrological chart almost from that perspective, much like fractals, that, that whatever these patterns are that set in place at birth, they become self-replicating patterns that express in the larger organism. And where we can find this most evident, I think, is in um, stellar diagnosis for health. Do you suppose this is where the, his idea for hermetic astrology came from? So the as above, so below? Yeah, I do. I think that is, and it's of course not said earlier, but in the um, Brotherhood of Light symbol that has popped up repeatedly through earlier slides and even the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, the two interlaced trines represent that, that mirroring in the physical of a, the other plane experience. Now, again, much like these fractals, which can be infinitesimally small yet impact the larger pattern, uh, the inner plane interpenetrates and has a molding effect over the physical. And the way astrology works is that events are happening in our soul, in this timeless, spaceless substance, before they filter down to the slower moving physical or the outer plane. This is pretty much how astrology functions. And that takes us to the law of attraction, back to your question earlier, Vicki, which is give me a concrete example of how a thought cell um, impacts your life. Basically, we engage in particular trends of thinking and feeling. And the nature is like attracts life. So we draw events and experiences into our lives which mirror these states of consciousness. And they might be thoughts of abundance and prosperity, of flow, thoughts of good health, radiant vitality, energy, uh, thoughts of affection, companionship, belonging. Or they might manifest as thoughts of lack and deprivation or poverty, of injury, and or lack of vitality or health, or they could manifest as solitude and not belonging. And we could go down the list with multiple examples of things, but you know, I could fit six on the screen. <laughs> now what I want to discuss in the end of tonight's class is specifically what we'll be studying over the, the next few weeks. Are there any questions or comments yet from the peanut gallery? No? I know you're out there. <laughs> All right, I'll have to entertain myself with those in the room.
we want to hear about sounding boards. Sounding boards. Tuning forks. <laughs> yeah, sounding boards, tuning forks, instruments of any kind. And what I love in the second course of the Brotherhood of Light Lessons, which is Astrological Signatures, is the way that Zane describes an astrological chart as basically being celestial music that's being played. There are other authors, um, which I'm reading now, that also sort of relate this whole process to music, not specifically from the astrological perspective, but the concept that all of life is, is built up of tone. So, I know very little about music. It's the, I'm, besides being mathematically um, challenged, I am uh, musically deprived as well. Not an appreciation of music and having many opportunities to listen to it in vast collections of music. Um, but really knowing how it works is somewhat limited. Nevertheless, what I do know is that in our octave scale or uh, pentatonic scales, a, a tone sounds differently when it's played on one instrument than another. Sound is part primarily in its air, moving at a particular rate of speed or vibration. That's ultimately what sound is. It's vibration or frequency, much like light, but received by another one of our senses. So, whether it's played on a piccolo or a cello, it does appear slightly different to us, according to the construct of the instrument or the sounding board in which it's played. Thus, when we go to study the signs next week, we're going to be relating to them as sounding boards. And the whole table of essential dignities gives us certain clues as to how a particular tone plays out in certain signs. So, we want you to think of the chart as a musical composition. The planets themselves are the tones. This is the, you know, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. <laughs> and not knowing music, this could just be BS up on the board here. I have no idea what those symbols say. Could say eat Chinese or something. Um, each planet expresses a distinct vibration as each musical note is distinct in its frequency. We can relate them to colors. We basically relate them to thought cells or what is described as urges. These are the motivators in our soul. When we get to the sixth class, we're going to actually talk about how the level of motivation is measured when we look at astronauts and how one can actually use a chart to better understand their personal hierarchy of needs. The houses, which form a miniature zodiac within the zodiac, these are the things that turn every two hours and or the horoscope, the hour view that we're looking at, they correspond to the auditorium. Now we all know when you go to a concert, depending on, you know, the sound is different depending on where, where your seat is. Our concert is actually unusual, is in that we're inside the auditorium, the music's being played outside. So, what matters here is whether you're sitting by a door, 
a window, or a solid wall. And just to give a, a description of that, um, 20 or so years ago, I used to attend um, Eastern Matins at the Russian Orthodox Church. And part of that ritual that takes place is at midnight, the carillion of bells rings, and half of the faithful go outside and process in candlelight, um, chanting around the outside of the sanctuary. The other half may remain um, inside the church. While you have, much like this marching band, while you have this chorus of vocalists moving around the space, the, the volume of the music rises and falls depending on whether they're passing by the windows of the church, the doors of the church, or those portions which are, are solid walls. So that's one experience where I really got a sense of how, how the outdoor concert um, really functioned in astrology. <coughs> the composition of this musical piece, which is your being, is determined by the aspects in the chart. And these are basically geometric relationships between the planets. Aspects add idiosyncrasies within the chart and within the character. They add conditioning energy, which is the stuff that kind of catapults us into thinking harmoniously or discordantly about certain areas of our lives. And as we know, I mean, we all have musical sensibility to the extent that there are things that we like and dislike. Most of us think that our taste is the best taste. And those that disagree with it have something seriously wrong with them. So each of us has different sense of what is harmonious or dissonant. You know, if I hear a card with loud hip hop music going down the street next to me, it might set my teeth on edge. There are other things I might respond more favorably to. And there are things that I play which I know set other people's teeth on edge. That let me know. So, <laughs> you know, much of life really evolves down to personal taste. All right. Any questions so far? We may be ending class early tonight. All right, here we go. Class text. Astrology and its Psychological Correspondence, Dennis Sutton. It's actually the horoscope Maker and Reader by Albert Benjamin. These are both available online as downloadable ebooks. As far as I know, the horoscope reader is available currently, and within the next day or two, the um, Astrology and its Psychological Correspondences will come available. Um, as it says here, they are right protected. No. Chances are they are not at this point. Yeah. So you won't have to wait for your personal code. But in the future, all of the new books that we produce are going to be in the form of e-books. And those of you who purchase the new CD-ROM of the 21 Brotherhood of Light Lessons, or as the downloadable format, you will get a code to open that, which will apply to any uh, future purchases. The purchase of any ebook. Of any ebook. Any from, book that's encrypted. Thank you. Gives you the certificate that you open up and then you, it's good for the CD-ROM or anything else. I am calling it the open sesame to all future <laughs> e-books. So that, that is provided. 
There are three other books which I've already mentioned that relate to this class and are on your handouts, which are Astrological Signatures, Orary Astrology, and Delineating the Horoscope, all by C.C. Zhang. And there's a wealth of other books written by hermetic writers, such as Doris J. Stone and Lynn Palmer, Ken Stone, um, that are all very useful. But in regards to just this class, the other um, two books mentioned at text are going to be the most useful.